Fred Joyle. Welcome to another episode of the Super Bold Podcast. I have a friend of mine that I've known for years who is a terrific dentist, orthodontist specifically, but also um, she's becoming a prolific author and her latest book just came out, One Team, One Score, and it's about how to create that powerful team in your dental practice. Uh, her name's Anne-Marie Gorsica and uh, Dr. Gorsica, Anne-Marie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Fred. It's great to be here. We've known so, each other about 10 years now. And yes, uh, it's, we wrote, go back. Yeah. You wrote so. the forward to my first book. Oh, so yes, I did. Yeah. I am eternally grateful to you for believing in me. Yes, and, and your son is also a fan of my second book, apparently, if I remember correctly. <laughs> At eight well, years old or something well, like that. I he gave was... my son the job in my office as director of marketing. And he <laughs> read your book, and he really ran with it. He would give me tips like, Mom, you've got to put the kids' contest down low where the kids can see it like in the grocery store, in the cereal section, they put certain things down low so the little kids can see it. And he was right. And he helped me with some prizes and some games. And, and then he uh, ended up taking a marketing course at Columbia University during COVID because that yeah. summer he couldn't do anything. So I said, well, you know, take a class or whatever. And it was very interesting because uh, he met the director of marketing for Nike, for American Dolls and different companies in New York. And um, he really enjoyed that, of course. Yeah. How fortunate is it that we can basically access any university in the world uh, online now and take these amazing courses? Uh, you know, when you and I went to school, it was like, here's your here's your professor. Best of luck. Well, <laughs> you know? well, I, I actually think they were using that group of 21 students sort of as a marketing experiment to r run certain ideas past them and see what was popular. So it was a very interesting class. He enjoyed it. Yeah, good for him. I, I love hearing that. I love hearing that his interest was sparked and he got to, to chase it. <laughs> you know, at, at, to such an extreme level. That's terrific. But as you know, I like to talk about boldness and how it affects uh, life careers in particular. And uh, so where did you summon the boldness to to write your first book? Because that's, that's a big move. Well, um, my dad was a college professor. And um, he believed that everyone by age 50 had a book in them. And uh, so he believes that everyone by age 50 has a book in them that they can write to help another person. So my father was a big encouragement to me. That's, I mean, that's a, but you didn't wait till you were 50. You, you, you jumped well, the gun on. <laughs> well, uh, he, he was really my inspiration for that first yeah. book. And it was the yeah. marketing book because my dad lives in Massachusetts and I'm out here in California. And uh, every morning on my drive to the office, I used to call him up and say, hi, dad, how are you doing? And he'd say, what are you doing today? And I'd say, oh, we're partnering with the local gym. We're going to invite them for orthodontic exams. And and he'd say, you know, you've got so many ideas. I think it would help a lot of people in dentistry. Why don't you just write a book and you'd be able to help other people uh, grow their practices and market their practices? And so he was he was a big inspiration for me. Yeah, and you basically packed in, what was it, 101? I'm trying to remember. 201. The, the, 201. 201, yeah. I knew it was a, an 01 yeah. something. Yeah, and uh, I... I do need to do an update. One of these days, I'm going to have to do second edition because obviously Google Plus is gone. Now it's Google My Business and, you know, a couple of other things have changed. And uh, so I, 
if I live long enough, I'd like to do a second edition on that book. Yeah, that you, you, you know, I have the same problem with both my books. I mean, everything is marketing is 15 years old. There's some funny stuff in that at this point, you know, uh, you know, about two thirds of it is, you, you know, universal, immutable rules of practice marketing. And then a bunch of other stuff just either doesn't exist or is completely changed. I, when I released Becoming Remarkable, I actually had to stop the printing of it because Google made a major change, like as I was going to press and it was like, it, it doesn't matter. It's still going to be outdated month, a few months after you print it. So uh, it's, you know, my latest thing was to write an ebook just because I can change it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but let's dive into your book. I mean, this is, this is a really important thing right now because practices are really struggling to attract good teams and, and build good teams. So uh, the book, if you're watching, I'm holding up the book here. Um, one team, one score, uh, leadership and teamwork for a successful dental practice. Also with a forward by my friend, Bernie Stoltz from Fortune Management. So uh, what's the overall point of this book, Anne-Marie? Well, <clears throat> one point, let's start with the first section, which is just leadership itself. What is leadership? Leadership is change. Leadership is being captain of the team. And one important point that I learned is a leader lives on the edge of consensus. A leader is not in the crowd. The leader is there to serve and to move a group forward in a new direction. So leadership is very uncomfortable. And if you look at amazing leaders, whether they be um, Gandhi or um, Robert F. Kennedy or uh, Reagan or Lincoln or um, Pope John Paul II, whoever you want to think of as amazing leaders who have changed the world, there are a lot of assassination attempts and a lot of assassinations. Yeah, yeah. If that's part of your job is people are gunning for you, literally, that's an uncomfortable job. Well, when Definitely. you are the leader, everyone is not going to agree with you. Yeah. And even in your own office, you know, you might put forward a new initiative and say, from now on, uh, this is the way we're going to do this. I'm making a change. And from now on, uh, we're going to add Fridays. Like maybe you haven't been working Fridays and one day you come in, you make a decision. Uh, we're going to work Fridays now. We're going to be open five days a week. And someone on your team is going to object and they're going to say, no, nope, can't do it, won't work, whatever. Well, you have to continue forward. Say, well, we'll miss you. I guess we'll have to leave. <laughs> but you yeah. can't be, you must be bold. You must be super bold. And especially women leaders. You know, women leaders must take risks. They must speak up. It's even harder for women leaders. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a dimension to that. Um, because if, 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 uh, men are strong leaders, they're considered to be, you know, strong leaders. If women are strong leaders, they're, uh, aggressive, <laughs> right? She's so aggressive, she, you know, and they'll, they're not afraid to throw the B word around about yeah. them even. It's and, like, and I, uh, so. And I think especially in a female office, there's some dynamic where, um, working with other females, uh, there's a certain friendship there. I will admit, you know, there's a certain emotional attachment, which perhaps a male leader wouldn't have. And also women are more emotional. I write in the book, the Achilles heel of women leaders. And that is that when we get upset, we have the urge to cry. And when you're a woman leader, you cannot cry. You have to do everything you can to hold it in. A man will get mad. They will pound their fists on the table, get mad, 
and that's effective, you know. Uh, one story I put in my book is that uh, the CEO of uh, PepsiCo, Indira Nooyi, the first female CEO of a Fortune 500 company, met with Steve Jobs to get advice on how to be a great leader. And um, I laughed that Steve Jobs said to her, you know, Indra, sometimes you just got to swear a little bit. <laughs> You've got to get <laughs> mad and swear a little bit. And that's what he told her. And, he, and she wrote in her biography, that was very hard for me. But let me tell you, it's really effective. Uh, Interesting. Now, yeah. Another great leader I write about in my book, and uh, he is perhaps the greatest leader, um, Alan Mullally. When you speak about modern leadership, all arrows point to Alan Mullally and how he came from Boeing to Ford Motor Company and turned around the company. And um, in his book, American Icon, he tells the story of what that was like when he went to Ford. And when I read that book, it reminded me of dentistry and it reminded me of orthodontics. Because Ford Motor Company at that time, uh, second generation, third generation since Henry Ford, was very, very inbred. And the leadership was the grandson, the grandnephew, the cousin, the aunt, the uncle, the sister. And we have the same problem in dentistry, that we, we have these dental icon families and uh, you join an organization and you look around and there's the father and there's the son and then there's all the son's classmates and then there's the father's cousin. And, and um, it's hard to lead people in that type of inbred situation. So um, when Alan Mullally went to Ford, one of the first things he did in his leadership, which is very important, and I think it's important for a dental practice also, is he instituted the weekly meeting, the weekly meeting to go over how are we doing? And he used a technique, okay, red light, yellow light, green light. What's green light? What's on schedule? What's yellow light? What could use a little more help? And what's red light? Like what is not going well? Where are we going wrong? And the first couple of weeks, no one wanted to speak up about any red lights. And he's saying, guys, there's got to be some red lights. We're losing like a billion dollars a month. <laughs> One of you needs to speak up. Like what is not working out? So finally, after a few meetings, one guy spoke up and said, well, my department's not doing well. We're not meeting our numbers. We're losing money. And Alan Mullally went, finally, finally, I have an honest person. And that's very important with leadership. You must have candor. You must be honest. You know, that was a big thing. And you can't you can't punish somebody who steps that's up right. and says my my department's okay. Well, you're fired. No, no, then you that's not nobody's going to say anything no, after you don't that. Punish the messenger, so. and that's why I named the book "One Team, One Score." We're all in it together. It's one score. It's one team. So that one department is Alan Mullally's department. And he needs to know about it. And one of his um, mantras was, there are no secrets. You know, there are no secrets. And also there are no silos. We're all in it together. So in my book, I do um, publish his 12 items that he would recite at the beginning of every meeting, the 12 things for people to remember. And he, he turned that company around. So he's really a great leader. Um, other than Indra Nooyi, who I admire so much, the other amazing leader of our lifetime is Ursula Burns, who became the first African-American CEO of a Fortune 500 company, Xerox Corporation. And uh, she wrote a biography and... Um, 
in her biography, she told the story of how she grew up in a New York project on welfare without a father. Her mother was a maid. She went to Catholic school. She went to New York uh, Institute of Technology, became a mechanical engineer, started working at Xerox as an intern. I think she said her first job was in the mail room and worked there every summer, went to Columbia, went to graduate school, got her graduate degree and gradually moved up through the company, became head of engineering. Um, she got married to a PhD researcher at Xerox Corporation. The guy was 20 years older than her. And she writes in her book that she recommends that all women leaders marry a man 20 years older than them so that he can stay home and take care of the kids. <laughs> so, uh, unusual advice, yeah. but uh, and, that's pretty good. Yes, yeah, she so. rose up, but an interesting point, and I want women to think about this. An interesting point is that both these two outstanding women, the first two CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, that were women, Indra Nooyi and Ursula Burns. When they got to the very top, and there were only like three people left at the very top of the organization, they both hit a roadblock where it became uncertain whether they would become CEO. And Ursula Burns actually threatened to quit. She went to the outgoing CEO. And she said, look, I've been offered CEO of Dell computer. Uh, either I move up or I'm leaving. And I mean, she had run every single department in the entire company. So they made arrangements and they, they actually gave it to her. She became CEO. And one thing I love about her talk about boldness. You're going to love this. Uh, obviously, people come up to her and say, oh, how does it feel to be the first African-American woman CEO of a Fortune 500 company? And her response was, well, I've been here 29 years. I've done about every job in the company. And I've earned this position. It's not like they picked me out of the circus. <laughs> And yeah. that was her response. No. And I like that response because it's a bold response. Yeah. It's a confident response. And she's telling the world, I earned this position. And there are many, many women out there that are stuck in organizations where they're like secretary for life, right? And they need to speak yeah. up and they need to say, look, I've done a lot of work for this organization. I don't want to be secretary for life. You got to move me up. I, I deserve to lead this organization forward. And um, so for a woman, there is not an option not to take a risk. Same thing with Indra Nooyi. When she was at the very top, maybe three people left. She was doing a lot of work. She was presenting all the reports to the board of directors. And one day she went to the CEO and she said, look, I just can't do this anymore. I'm doing all the work. I'm reviewing, I'm preparing all the reports. I'm presenting to the board of directors. At some point she needs to be the CEO. So she also made it, but I'm, I'm very, that both of those women, if they had not spoken up, they would not have gotten into that position necessarily. I, I think that's that's true of a lot of people who are not bold enough to say, look, I'm I'm either getting moved up or I'm moving out, and I'm you know because the bold move is to not be bluffing. Right. Right. <laughs> but but you know, and and your point is it's it's very easy, you know, you know, as as a CEO myself, it's a lot of times you just go, no, no, that person's great right there. It's like she's doing such a good job. I never want her to to leave. But a great leader says, look, if I'm growing you, which is which is part of my responsibility, I have to accept the fact that you may outgrow me right. or this business. 
Um, and but I need you to be better, and I need to encourage you to be better, and t help you to be better with that risk, because otherwise I'm stagnating right. you. I'm trapping. And part of uh, and I've, part of motivation is growth. So if you yes. want an excellent team, uh, you want to grow people and develop people that are going to move on. Necessary, you know. I, I've had so many people from my practice over the years go to much bigger jobs in bigger practices where they left my practice, maybe they were treatment coordinator, and they went to another orthodontic office, got paid $8 an hour more, and were the manager of the entire practice. And my response to them is, congratulations, you earned this. I don't have that position for you because I have people above you or I have a manager already, but good for you. You've earned it and, and we're going to miss you. And you can't feel bad about that. If you have good people that are incredibly motivated, they're going to, they're going to move on to higher positions. So let's, let's talk about the, the second element of your, your, one team, one score in, in it's in the word team is, is how, how, how do you create that, that strong teamwork? What, what are the ways that that can happen? Well, one exercise you can do in your practice, and I talk about it in the book, in the chapter culture A good exercise is to sit down and say, what do we desire? for our excellent team culture. What are the traits that we're looking for? And you can have it written down because when you interview people, then you'll know you're looking for those traits and you can evaluate those traits. Positive attitude, good work ethic, excellent attendance, quality uh, oriented. You know, you can just go down your list, make your list. But even more important is to have your list, what will you not tolerate? And at the top of that list is bad attitude. And everything mm -hmm. else beyond bad attitude is a factor of bad attitude. Not showing up, not being a team player, uh, being negative, you know, down, on and on and on. Yeah, being a clock puncher, right, right. Um, so, you know, it's not it's not my job. That's, you know, whenever somebody says that, it's like, uh, yeah, I don't ever want to hear you say right, that. Right. So <laughs> yeah. when you're clear about those things and you've done it together with your team and everyone has a copy of it, when an issue comes up, um, so and so didn't help with sterilization and ran out and left a mess. Okay. <laughs> Then you yeah. can talk about it and say, you know, that's something we really don't tolerate. Before you leave for the day, you need to ask everyone, is there anyone else who needs help? Is there anything I can do before I go? Say goodbye to everybody. Leave on a positive note. So as a team, you put your rules in place. And um, every once in a while, there'll be someone who just doesn't fit into the team culture. I mean, they might be a performer, they might actually be pretty good at their job, but for whatever reason, they ruffle too many feathers to make the day a positive work day. And at some point you just say, you know, it's not a fit. And hopefully you say that within the first 90 days of hiring so that there's no consequence. There's, there's less, yeah. yeah, well, and it's, it's but but yeah, and in the hardest ones are the ones who are really good at what they do and have a terrible attitude uh, because you're like, oh, they're, they're, they do this so well, but they just don't belong here. But they're poisoning the well. That's the reality. Right. And, and you know, you have to pay attention to customer reviews and customer responses and, you know, all of those things that you're trying to make your office the best that it can be for the patient. So um, now another thing that's important for teamwork is your positive energy, the positive energy that you share every day. 
And uh, one of the things I wrote in the book is um, I wrote about the five love languages. You know, that that book, The Five Love Languages. Yeah. Now, that's another book my son read. All right. And I was going <laughs> over the book, The Five Love Love Languages with my son and with my husband. And my son's like, oh, mom, come on. You know, asking my son, what's your love language? And and he kind of made fun of me a little bit. And then he went to high school. And one day they're having an assembly and the, the head of the school says, today we're going to discuss the five love languages. <laughs> and my son's like, wow. you've got to be kidding me. I can't get away well, from this. Ask your team. <laughs> ask your team. If you're going to be appreciated, what is it that's the most meaningful for you? Is it a financial reward? Is it a gift reward? Is it public praise? Is it uh, development? Um, what is it that matters the most to you? Now, I did this with my team. And uh, I have a very outstanding team member. And um, her name is Lindsay. And one day, she actually got our accounts receivable to zero. It had never been done in the history of my practice. There's always someone who owes money, right? But one day yes. she comes running to me with the report. She's like, Dr. Gruska, Dr. Gruska, I did it. No one owes us money. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a miracle, right? I took her report. I put a gold seal on it. I had her autograph it and I framed it and I put it in the wall on my in my office. And I told her, this is the wall of fame that you are on the wall of fame. So I wanted to get her um, a bottle of champagne to get her a gift or something to thank her. And she says, oh, Dr. Gorska, I don't drink champagne. I said, well, what do you really want? She goes, honestly, what do I really want? She goes, I want chips and dip. <laughs> and um, I okay. got her a giant bag. I went to the grocery store. I got <laughs> every type of chip I could possibly get every type of dip I could possibly get. And I handed her this giant bag, okay? And I asked my team, you know, what do you really want? And they said, honestly, Dr. Gruska, we love real food, real food. We just would love it if you got us pizza or whatever. And those are the things that make work fun, you know, the things that you do for each other. I do list in my book the three phrases of affirmation. Uh, I appreciate you. You know, how often do you say to your team members or do they say to each other, I appreciate you? Um, I admire you. You know, I, I always say to my team, you are so smart. You are so much smarter than I am. I don't even know how to run some of the programs in my computer system. And you're like a whiz at it, right? Or certain things that they do in the office. I I always tell my um, my financial manager, you know, if you and I encourage my team to finish four year college. And even if you could get a graduate degree, I said, if you had an MBA, you'd be running UCSF Medical Center. That's how good you are. And that's how good they are. They're really good. And people need to know you admire them. You admire the work they do and how well they do it. And then the last one is you belong here. Mm. You know, wow. I I'll bet a lot of people don't I, know I that. Recently one, hired, you know. My most recent hire, I hired from Amazon. I hired a young girl. She had no dental experience, but she worked the 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. shift at Amazon. And I said to myself, if she can get up every morning and go work at 4 a.m. at Amazon, this girl has a work ethic. So we hired her, we taught her everything we know. I sent her to get her uh, radiology license, paid for it, she got it. And I tell her, you belong here. You are talented at this job and this job has purpose for you. Um, you are changing lives here. You know, and I think she's going to stick it out in dentistry. And 
if she wanted to do her RDA, I would even pay for her to go get her RDA license because I believe in her and she belongs here. She belongs in orthodontics. So I, I, love I think that. that's important love that for one. people to hear that, you know, and I tell yeah. my team all the time, uh, I wanted to be an orthodontist in seventh grade. Okay? I didn't know the salary. I didn't know the conditions. I didn't know I'd have to go to school for like 11 years. I, I just loved my orthodontist. I love the office. I thought, well, how much fun would this be to work in this environment with these nice people, do all kinds of fun things. And um, I think we need to remember that dentistry is a very, very nice job. Um, sometimes someone says, well, <clears throat> I could get paid more doing this. So that's right. You could. Right. You could get paid $100 an hour collecting the money in the little booth on the Bay Bridge. But do you really want to sit there all alone in a little booth inhaling the car exhaust all day? Is that fulfilling to you? Now, for most people, the answer is no, that's not fulfilling. If you're antisocial and you want to sit in a little booth all day, then that's the best job in the world for you. But if you're a, if you're a people person, you love people, you love your community, you love serving people, then dentistry is the best job for you. All right. So, so now the third element of your book is collaboration. And I think it's the linchpin that, that pulls everything together. Yes. Um, by virtue of the word itself. But, you know, how do you create that atmosphere of collaboration? Well, one thing I learned, and I think it's a very important lesson, organizations or a group of people working together. When they come together, they go through four stages. Forming, they form the group. Storming, the time of the first disagreement. Then norming, what are our normal practices? And once you get those three things together, performing, you get to your highest level of performance. Now, what most people don't realize is that <clears throat> storming is an extremely important process. It's the same thing in marriage. Uh, there's a, an episode with uh, Patrick Lencioni, uh, and he said that when he was in college, he and his wife, he was dating his wife, and there was this other couple, and he's a, he and his wife would have disagreements, but this other couple never had a disagreement. And then 10 years later, he and his wife are happily married. They've got like four kids, but they're still having their disagreements. But the other couple is divorced. And why is that? They could never work through the storming process that eventually at the first disagreement, the group is going to have to sit down and work out a disagreement. Now, someone in the group might actually say, I'm going to quit. And you need to tell them, okay, quit. This is not for you. But you're not going to prevent the entire group from moving forward because one person refuses to perform a certain activity. So that, that is something, especially in, uh, I would say, dental organizations. When you come in and... You know, everybody has to get along. Everybody has to play nice, whatever. If you can't get through that storming phase, then you're not going to get anything done at all. You just, you know, that one person is just going to put a roadblock up and you can't move past it. You're just stuck. And you don't want that to happen in your business. You've got to work through. And, and the forming, storming, norming, performing process. This was actually studied by Harvard Business School. Um, that happens with every organization. Every time one new person comes, the dynamics change. 
And there will eventually be a disagreement between two people that you have to work through. And it's how you handle that that gets you to the next stage. Yeah, and they may be somebody who has never learned how to make a relationship work. And now they're, now they're coming into your environment. You need them to pull in the same direction as everybody right. else and understand that digging their heels in is unacceptable. Yeah. And that, that that this is a collaborative effort, and there there is no job silo. Right. Uh, th th it is like we are getting this whole thing done, and everybody's responsible in some way for everything. Right. Uh, you're not. There's no absolution that's like, oh, I did, that's not my responsibility, so that's on her. Yeah. Uh, you could say, well, yeah, except you saw it happening and you didn't step right. in. Right. You didn't fix it. It's all right to observe it and say, wow, that's her responsibility. But you still got to say, I can still, this, I know this tray wasn't sterilized. Right. So I'm going to swap yeah, it out. I see it. Uh, instead of okay. saying, I can't wait till the morning huddle when I can say that she didn't, right. she used an unsterilized tray. Well, it's, yeah. I see so. it, I own it. Right? We're all in it yeah. together. I see it, I own it. Um, I don't have this story in the book, but I'm going to tell you this story because I think it's one of the best leadership stories I ever heard in my life. Um, it's from a book called Leadership on the Edge. Um, the story of when Scottie Pippen uh, was on the Chicago Bulls after Michael Jordan quit. After Michael Jordan retired, Scottie Pippen is on the Bulls. And they're in the finals and the Chicago Bulls are down two games, zero. They have zero wins. The other team has two wins and they've got three seconds on the clock and the score is tied. And the coach, what was his name? Jackson, Phil, was it Phil Jackson, the coach of the Chicago Bulls? I'm trying to remember. Phil Jackson, I think he may have been yeah. the coach of the Bulls at the time. He eventually became Lakers okay. coach. So he says to um, Scottie Pippen, throw in the ball to this other team player. He's going to go for the winning shot. Okay. The huddle's over. He looks out on the court. Where's Scottie Pippen? Scottie Pippen's sitting on the bench. He turns to Scottie Pippen. He goes, are you in? Scottie Pippen says, no. He says no to his coach. Can you believe that? Now, it might be a situation in your practice. Someone says no to you. What do you do? Phil Jackson immediately goes to the rookie. Rookie, you throw the ball in to so-and-so. Pippen's out. Okay? Rookie off the bench, throws the ball. Guy gets the ball, shoots the winning basket. They win the game. Okay. They go in the locker room. And the coach is very smart because he says to himself, I'm not getting involved in this situation. Right? When you're the leader, sometimes you have to step back and say, I'm getting off the dance floor. I'm going up to the balcony because I'm not getting involved with this. I mean, obviously, Frank in subordination. Everybody on the team saw it, right? So the center, and I forget the name of the center guy, says, that was the most selfish thing I've ever seen in the history of basketball. He goes, I have never been more upset in my entire life, right? In your dental practice, you have no stronger power than the peer pressure of the team. If someone is not performing, if someone is showing up late, you need your team to step up and say, look, we're a team, we're not gonna allow this. It can't just be the leader, it has to be the team because you're all in it together. It's one team, one score. And someone needs to say, look, when you don't show up, that gives all of us 20% more work. We are stressed out and we cannot offer as high customer service when you don't show up. So we either need a team member who shows up 
or maybe you should quit, right? But have your team, yeah. have your team be part of the collaborative culture of your practice because you are all in it together. And that's why at team meetings, it's really important everyone have a voice, everyone have a chance to speak up, everyone gets to give their opinion, what's working, what's not working, what problems did we have this week, what do we need to fix? And that's how you come up with solutions. And that's how you come up with unity of the team. And, and yeah, and, and that's really, when you've built a strong culture, the true test of it is, is the team defending that culture? And maybe even more strongly than you would. Right. That's because, and they need to know that it is their right and responsibility to defend that culture right. and strengthen it. Uh, and that's exactly what you're talking right. about. It's like, they're going to call somebody on the carpet and you don't have right. to. And that's, that's when you've really empowered people to create a great place to work. And I, and and I want to it. just also bring up one other thing in the book about unity training and the system of the Navy SEALs. I talk about the Navy SEALs. And in that unit of the Navy SEALs, the leader, whoever that is, is part of the unit. And you as the leader, if you're the dentist, you have to know that your team has your back. And your team members have to know you have their back. So the dentist should never feel alone. They should feel like my team is supporting me. They've got my back. I've got their back. And if you don't feel that, that's not a good feeling. That's not a good thing. If you, if you feel someone is actively sabotaging your office, well, then maybe that person needs to go. Yeah, I think there's no maybe yes. about it. <laughs> You know. <laughs> and that is not an easy thing. That's not an easy thing. No. So on a final so. note, one final thing. The team handbook, okay? Um, you must have a team handbook. And I always say that uh, working in an office without a team handbook is like living in a lawless land, right? There's nothing written down. There's no understanding of what's expected. And in my book, I cite two organizations that are perhaps the most well-organized organization. The first is the airline industry. Okay, imagine this. You have a group of people, two pilots. Maybe they've never flown together before. You have a group of stewardesses. Maybe they've never met each other before. They come together 10 minutes before the flight, the lead pilot speaks for five minutes. They go over a few things. The two pilots go in the cockpit. Check, 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 check. Down the list. The people in the back, they know exactly what their jobs are. They've taken a test. They know exactly how things are done. And they work together seamlessly the very first time they ever meet. Imagine if your office were like that, you know? So the first hour of the first day of employment, give your new team member the employee handbook, have them sit there for one hour and read it, pay them to read it, go over a few things. This is the dress code. This is what time you show up. This is what you do before you leave. And there's, there's no misunderstanding. You can start off running, you know, that they already know what to do. Um, the other organization that I've always admired and I will always admire is um, the symphony orchestra. Hmm. Because in the symphony orchestra, first of all, everybody's there because they're passionate about what they do. They love what they do and they're passionate. Everybody plays their own part. They're prepared. There's no question who the leader is. The conductor's on the podium. There's no question, should we follow him? Should we not follow him? And everybody plays together in perfect harmony, perfect tempo. There's eye contact, there's body language, there's understanding. 
And in my opinion, that is the perfect organization. There's no, no misunderstanding. And uh, wouldn't that be wonderful if you could say my dental office, you know, this is my symphony, my dental office, that everyone plays their part. They do it beautifully and expertisely and they have autonomy and they're proud of their work. And we all work together really well. And you're the conductor and everybody else is doing something and is better at it than you would be just like in the orchestra. That's right. You, you are, the conductor is not the, by anywhere near the best cello That's player right. uh, or trumpet player or, you know, symbolist, whatever yeah. he or she is the conductor. Right. Uh, so, well, this is, this is great stuff. And so I, I want people to know how to get your book. Uh, one team, one score. Well, I am on Amazon. If you look up my name, and my last name is hard to spell, Anne Marie Gorsica, G O R C Z Y C A. I have five books on Amazon. Um, the new book, the Kindle is up uh, today. The hardcover and the paperback are just going up. I actually had one little teeny mistake on page 143 that I have fixed, so it had to oh, wow. take it down and put back up. But um, my most popular book is actually my HR book. And uh, I'd like to also invite readers to check that out too. It's called Beyond the Morning Huddle, because uh, they'll get a lot of tips from that also. The book you wrote the forward for is, um, it all starts with marketing because it really does. And then my third book is At Your Service, Customer Service. My fourth book is Take Action, Treatment Coordination, which basically is sales and how do you work on your sales in your practice. And then this book is One Team, One Score. And then I've got one more book left in me that I'm going to try to write. <laughs> and if I live long enough, I, I hope to get one more book out. And then I will have put down everything I can possibly think of that goes into how to run a dental practice. And I've been doing this 33 years and um, I write in my book, I did get my master's degree in health management and policy from the Harvard School of Public Health, where we did study business concepts. And I do think that dentists in general do need to educate themselves on all business concepts, uh, not only leadership and teamwork, but also accounting and uh, sales and customer service. All the things I write about are uh, parts of the practice that we're all trying to get better and to master. And it takes a lifetime, but it's challenging and it's exciting. and. Hopefully, it's extremely rewarding for everybody that works on it in your practice. Yeah, but, well, this is all really valuable stuff, and all your books are, are contributing to uh, an extremely valuable lexicon of information for running a great practice. So, uh, Emery, thank you so much for doing this and, and for your contribution to your uh, great profession. Well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Great talking with you.